singing that song. But I never knew its origin. Here's what I knew about Amazing Grace. I knew that it was one of my grandma's favorite songs. She was a deaconess at the Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Muskogee, Oklahoma. And she often started off a worship service singing that song a cappella, as I just did. And the next thing that I knew was that somewhere along the way, I heard that Amazing Grace was the most recorded song in history. It's been recorded 6,600 times to date. And finally, I knew that it was one of the central theme songs of the 1960s civil rights movement. The words of Amazing Grace embodied the hopes and dreams of African Americans who felt that freedom was a right for every American in this self-proclaimed land of the free, home of the brave. So I knew all that. But I didn't know perhaps the most important and ironic fact about Amazing Grace. The fact that it was written by the man pictured here, John Newton. John Newton, born in 1725, the son of a commander of a ship that sailed in the Mediterranean. Newton lived a fairly wretched life, and he ultimately became the captain of a slave ship that sailed off the coast of Sierra Leone. The man who wrote the song that represented the freedom movement was an active participant in the slave trade. Now that's irony. <laughs> because slaves were considered chattel, objects, certainly not humans, deserving of rights. But John Newton looked into the eyes of those slaves who were being abused and, and beaten. And he had an epiphany that went against everything that he had ever been taught. And he wrote, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was, was lost, oh, oh, oh but now I'm found, was blind, but now participated in a few more slave missions after his transformation. He made sure that slaves under his command were, were treated, quote unquote, humanely. <laughs> and ultimately, he left the sea altogether and became the captain um, and became a minister and devoted his life to the Judeo-Christian principle of treating others as he wished to be treated. So my long history with Amazing Grace and, and the study of John Newton led me to a social concept that I think is, is well worth exploring. I'm calling this concept mental image editing. So I can kind of hear you thinking, what is mental image editing? <laughs> and, and why am I listening to a singer and performance artist tell me about some physiological or or psychological concept? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so, I'll answer the second question first. I consider myself to be more than just a singer. I am a griot. In the West African tradition, a griot is a musician, an orator, and a unifier. So, I learned early on in my career that what I could do with my voice was change the world. So what I enjoy singing the most is songs that have an important social message. Leonard Bernstein, I think, 
said it best. He was an American composer, and he said, music can name the unnameable and communicate the unknowable. In my mind's eye, I can feel the pain of those slaves on John Newton's slave ship when they sang, Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I, I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. I am a long, long way from home. As I went deeper into the irony of amazing grace in John Newton's life, I searched for a lesson to leave us with, and I came up with, with this concept of mental image editing, a process whereby an individual filters and corrects negative stereotypes that have been conveyed from upbringing or mass media portrayals. I submit that if each and every one of us submitted to this filtering and correction process, that world peace even would be within our reach. Yes, when this flesh and heart shall fail and mortal life shall cease, I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. You know, when you start talking about race and prejudice, people get a little uncomfortable or they, they get defensive or sometimes even self-congratulatory. And it's true that African Americans are no longer slaves in the United States and we no longer overtly refer to people as chattel or objects. But I've got three observations. One, that the average person is blind, just as John Newton suggested, to subtle negative isms based on limited interaction with people that we consider to be other than us. I suggested racism, sexism, ageism, all forms of discrimination stem from a lack of interaction. Sandra and Matthew Blakesley wrote a book called The Body Has a Mind of Its Own. And in that book, they, they reference a study about young kittens in their early stages of life. If you carry around a young kitten and never put it down and let it interact with its environment, that kitten will be essentially blind for the rest of its life, never being able to distinguish objects or shapes or colors. I suggest that the same is true of us when we fail to have quality interaction with each other. Think about it. John Newton is credited with writing the six word, the six verses of, of Amazing Grace, but scholars suggest that he, he captured the melody from listening to the slaves that he was transporting. And then there's cultural and social blindness. We are all in this together, but we are not looking at the same things in the same way at the same time. It seems to me that if we are able to filter and edit our mental images, that we would be able to change the way we look at each other. The cultural and social blindness finds its way into our courtrooms, into our media images, into our jewelry boxes, into our police cars, and it causes preventable injuries and social injustices that could be corrected if we would but correct our mental images. 
Think about it. In the last Super Bowl, a popular soft drink company cast an African-American couple in the commercial. Yay! Well, <laughs> not so much. The black woman in the commercial was dressed very austerely. Black women are unattractive. She was scowling and angry the t entire time. Black women are mean. And her husband, no matter what he did, could not satisfy her. Black women emasculate men and are dominant. The commercial culminated uh, when a, a very beautiful, scantily clad, blonde-haired, blue-eyed white woman came and sat down on the bench next to them. Of course, the African-American male couldn't take his eyes off her. He follows her the entire time, looking at her longingly and lovingly. And the mean, angry, dominant, unattractive black woman throws the soda can at his head. He ducks, and it hits the pretty and sexy, innocent white woman. Now, this was supposed to be funny. <laughs> But it caused such a stir because it had so many negative images about black women. This could have used a little editing, both literal and figurative. It would have been welcomed here. Finally, I just have to say that if we all would take our personal responsibility to edit our mental images, it would have positive ripple effects throughout society. You see, John Newton influenced the life of William Wilberforce, who worked for 20 years to end the slave trade in Britain. And William Wilberforce influenced the life of Abraham Lincoln, who signed the Emancipation Proclamation to end the slave trade in the United States, and so on and so on. Shakespeare said, that which is called a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So whether we are talking about mental image editing or we're talking about just a, applying a little grace to our interaction with each other on a daily basis. Do you know what I find to be simply amazing? What I find to be simply amazing is that all any one of us has to do to make this world a substantially better place is be willing to see. Oh, and maybe not so much with our eyes, but with our hearts. <laughs>